Today they're digging and digging, filling sandbag after sandbag to try to protect these beaches. As residents of one port city prepare for the Russian advance, the mayor of another town, Mariupol, pleads for aid. The best wish uh, of our people was to uh, stop somehow the war, to stop bombing, to stop shelling. But today uh, and yesterday, their best wish is to find some food and water. The UK announces sanctions on 386 Russian politicians, but Vladimir Putin claims restrictions will make Russia stronger. Good afternoon. Russia appears to be preparing for an assault on the Ukrainian capital after satellite images showed a 40-mile convoy of tanks, troops and artillery and appears it's redeploying to surround Kiev. Well, that comes as Britain and the United States warned that Moscow may be masking a possible plan for a chemical attack in Ukraine. That's after it claimed, without evidence, that the US has been developing biological weapons in the country. The UN Security Council will meet later to discuss those allegations, which the White House has dismissed as laughable. Well, in other developments, the city of Dnipro was hit overnight and this morning. It's believed to be the next likely target as Russia's southern offensive moves north. Two other strikes near airports in the western cities of Lutsk and Ivano-Frankivsk were also reported. In the eastern city of Kharkiv, the regional governor says a psychiatric hospital has been hit by a Russian airstrike. He said there's no word on the number of casualties, but 330 people were in the hospital. In the south, Ukrainian authorities say 1,300 civilians are now dead in Mariupol, which continues to come under heavy bombardment. And the Russian Defence Ministry says Moscow-backed separatists have captured the town of Volnovaka, that is just north of Mariupol. Meanwhile, the, U the UN's nuclear watchdog says it's now lost all communications with Chernobyl, which is under Russian control. And Russia's Defence Ministry says that it will open five humanitarian corridors today to let civilians flee from the towns of Kiev, Sumy, Kharkiv, Chernihiv and Mariupol. Well, Katerina Vitozzi reports now on the latest developments. Russia hadn't prepared for this. With guns and anti-tank missiles, Ukrainian forces repel an assault outside of the capital, Kiev. This firefight was filmed yesterday. This is payback for the bombing of Mariupol, this soldier says. According to British intelligence, unexpected Ukrainian ground resistance is limiting the progress of Russia's forces. The foreign fighters amongst them seen by Russia as Western provocation. Regarding the gathering mercenaries from around the world for Ukraine, we see them, the Western sponsors of the Ukrainian regime, do not keep it secret. They do it openly, disregarding international law. But how long can this resistance hold out? These satellite pictures, taken within the last 24 hours, show what looks like a reforming of Russian military convoys outside of the capital, Kiev. You can see towed artillery in firing positions. US defence officials say some Russian contingents are just nine miles away from the capital and that Russia is preparing for a fresh wave of assaults here and across major Ukrainian cities. Captured on CCTV this morning, this is the first time the eastern city of Dnipro has been hit. Sky News has verified this video from just before 6am. There's no obvious military target here. This was a shoe factory. Now it's embers and ash cloaking what looks like the body of yet another victim in a bloody war with ever multiplying front lines. More than two million people have now fled Ukraine. Those still here in besieged cities like the northern Kharkiv 
find shelter wherever they can. An underground station now covered with blankets, phone chargers, even a vase of flowers as people just try to make the surreal feel more bearable. I'm worried about my house, my friends' houses, and all of Ukraine I'm worried about very much. And I'm scared what will happen to me. As families cower in basements, there's the looming spectre of chemical and biological weapons attack and passionate denials from Ukraine that it has none. No chemical or any other weapons of mass destruction were developed on my land. The whole world knows that. You know that. And if you do something like that against us, you will get the most severe sanctions response. But Russia claims the US has been making biological weapons in Ukrainian labs. It's convened the United Nations Security Council today to discuss. But Boris Johnson told Sky News' political editor Beth Rigby that this is pure strategy. The stuff that you're hearing about uh, chemical weapons, this is straight out of their playbook. They start saying that uh, there are chemical weapons uh, that uh, have been stored by uh, their opponents or by the Americans. And so when they themselves deploy uh, chemical weapons, as I, as I fear they, they may, they have a, a, a sort of a maskirovka, a, a fake story ready to go. A fake story with very real victims. Humanitarian corridors are being tried again today to help thousands escape ravaged cities where aid can't get in and people can't get out. Catherine Ivatotsi, Sky News. Some breaking uh, lines to bring you now uh, coming to us from Ukraine. Of course, we've been keeping a watching brief on any advances from Russian troops on the capital of Kiev. Well, the mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, has said that he thinks that Kiev has enough vital supplies uh, to last for another couple of weeks. He thinks that there are still around two million people who remain in the city and his brother, Vladimir says that some men and women who initially fled the capital city are now returning to Kiev in preparation for a fight with Russian troops. Now, in the last hour, the Ukrainian president has released a video message online. Vladimir Zelensky said that Ukraine had reached a strate strategic turning point in its war with Russia, but cautioned that it was not possible to say how long the fighting would continue. For 16 days, I know many people are feeling tired now. I understand it. I understand it's all about emotions and it's life. When we mobilize our efforts and when we see that we can win, we expect the enemy fall quicker. But the truth is, this is the war, this is the fight. We need more time, we need more patience, we need to be wise, we need to do our job the best we can to gain the victory. We can't say how many more days we will need to take our land back, but we can do it because we want to do it. We already have strategic victory, we are already on the way to the victory. This is our patriotic war. They destroyed residential houses in Sumer region. They continue torturing Mariupol, Ivano-Frankivsk. They targeted this place as well. So they carry on their invasion and that's why we require further, more rigid sanctions against Russia because they must pay for what they do. Every day they must pay. European Union has to do more to implement a decision, to do more for Ukraine, for the European Union, for everyone. All European nations expect this to happen. 
Well, let's have a look at all of the latest movements that are taking place on the ground in Ukraine. Ali Fortescue is here to walk us through it. As we enter the third week of this conflict, General Sir Richard Barons is with us. He's been monitoring what's been happening on the ground in Ukraine. Let's look first at Kiev, because we know that Russian advances are getting ever closer. This convoy that we saw has now dispersed, that we saw slowly getting towards the capital. So over the last 10 days, we've seen <clears throat> Russian forces advancing on Kiev from the northwest and the northeast. And now we're seeing two developments. One is they're beginning to encircle more of the city. And secondly, they're beginning to get off the roads in the way that that convoy was stuck for some time and begin to deploy into battle positions. And that would indicate that the fight for Kiev is about to start. So Kiev almost surrounded. And if we look at a closer map of the capital, it's worth saying this isn't going to be straightforward, is it, for the Russians? Because this is an urban area and fighting in a place that is not just urban, but as big as Kiev is very mm. challenging. So by some distance, this will be the biggest fight so far in this war. Uh, Kiev is a city of 2.8 million people originally, three times the size of Manchester. And as the Russians close up for, on, a, on a number of routes towards the city, uh, their, their forces will be led by their, their tanks and their armoured forces supported by artillery. And they're going to meet stiff resistance from the Ukrainian uh, military. However, as they reach the outskirts of the built-up area, they'll transition that so the force is likely to be led by infantry supported by an awful lot of artillery and air power. And they'll meet really stiff Ukrainian resistance. And, and the Russians will start to have to destroy large chunks of the city to break in. And this is where the potential abhorrent question of chemical weapons may arise. Because if the Russians are held up and they're stalled or they fail, they may resort to chemical weapons to try to unstick it with all the appalling consequences that that would bring. OK, and something, of course, that Boris Johnson was warning about yesterday. Let's talk um, briefly about what's happening northwest of the capital in Beresyana, because we have a satellite image that shows what we think are rocket launchers there. Tell us a bit about this. So this is a, a, a assessed to be a very good example of how the, the equipment that was on that road in that convoy has begun to break out and deploy. Th this is most likely six rocket launchers. They're 35 kilometres from Kiev right now but they're in range of Kiev right now. So 35 kilometres away from the capital. And if we look at what is happening in the rest of the country, of course, the focus in the north is on Kiev, but in the south, where, where should we be focusing on? So, so it's very important to look beyond Kiev, although that remains the, 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 the big um, main effort. So in the south, the Russian forces are fighting for Mariupol. They've not taken it yet. But if they are successful, they will have achieved that strategic objective of linking Russia through Mariupol to the Crimea. Staying with the south, the thing we're expecting to see unfold are Russians moving west towards Odessa to complete the isolation of Ukraine and its economy from the sea. And then the last 24 hours have been uh, some interesting developments. And in Dnipro, the first air attack, which suggests that perhaps after Mariupol, the Russians are going to close up to the river wherever they can. And then way over in the west of Ukraine, air attacks on a couple of airfields, which are the first time that's happened, and that's designed to uh, reduce the ability of the Ukrainian Air Force to operate. And it's the first time, as you say, we've seen attacks like this this far west in Ukraine. It is indeed. Thank you so much, General Sir Richard Barons. Thank you. Well, taking over the city of Odessa, as we were hearing there, in the south of Ukraine, it's seen as one of Russia's next strategic goals. Sky's Nick Martin says that the beaches of the city are now being fortified by the civilians there. The situation in Odessa is there is now, as we've seen across Ukraine, the most remarkable effort by civilians to try to protect their beloved city here on the southwest coast of Ukraine. It is a critical target for Vladimir Putin. If he is able to capture Odessa, he will be able to cut off Ukraine from the sea. It is a critical seaport and it is the beaches that are now being fortified by civilians to protect them themselves from the might of the Russian army. Just have a look at this. In the summer, by the way, they're sunbathing and fun on these beaches. Today they're digging and digging, filling sandbag after sandbag to try to protect these beaches. It is the most remarkable effort in the most terrible, chilling weather. Let's just have a look around here. The several beaches across the coast here on the southwest coast of Ukraine 
350,000 sandbags have been filled by these people in the last two weeks alone. Why are they doing that? Well, they fear that out there in the Black Sea, there is a build-up of Russian military and navy that have plans to try and mount some kind of amphibious assault on the beaches of Odessa. And the Odessans are not going to have any of it, they say. And so these sandbags are going to be put out across the coast here to try to prevent that from happening. The president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, said that he has information that the Russians plan to attack Odessa just within the next few days. And if he's right, then this might, might just be able to stave that off. But it's hard to see how that can be possible. Just look at this effort. A human chain. Look at the weather. It's absolutely freezing cold. And yet they're still putting these sandbags on the back of these lorries and moving them to the wherever they feel they can be, uh, be beneficial. Now, we do know that Vladimir Putin has his sights set on Odessa. It's the pearl of the Black Sea. It's a hugely strategic port. And there's all sorts of activity going on up and down this coast. But here, right now, I have to say that it's quiet. And you could say eerily quiet. But there is some intelligence to suggest last week that the, some Russian Navy ships were spotted off the coast. It's a murky, dark, a murky, windy day today. And you can't see any evidence of that. But what you can see is a huge effort to try and fortify the beaches here. Just behind me, in normal times, just a few weeks ago, this was a yacht club. In the summer, people come here, they have fun, they enjoy the coastline. And now look at it. You know, it's just the most remarkable effort being played out in front of us. In the town, they're building barricades almost on every street. The cafes, Odessa's famous for its really picturesque cafes. I was here about five years ago, sitting, having tea in the square. Now it's completely deserted. Those big steel blockades, the hedgehogs, designed to stop tanks rolling through the city. They're almost on every corner, and there is a bit of a twitchiness in the air. But here on the coast, the sandbags are really the key. But uh, it just makes you wonder just what and how effective they'll be against the might of the Russian military, who seem really dead set on taking Odessa. Uh, it really was the sort of jewel in the crown of the Soviet Union. And Vladimir Putin has big ideas about new Russia. And it would be hard to see Odessa not being a big part of that. And so they're doing all they can, and they're waiting uh, for what might happen in the next few days. It's cold, it's windy, it's snowy, but it's not putting them off. Nick Martin there in Odessa. Well, let's take a look at some of the key diplomatic events that we're expecting to see today. Well, in just a moment, we're going to be bringing you an EU Council news conference that is taking place in Versailles in France. The French President Emmanuel Macron and the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and the EU Council President Charles Michel will be speaking after their two-day summit on, of course, Ukraine. Well, at three o'clock this afternoon, the UN Security Council meets in New York at Russia's request to discuss what Moscow claims are the military biological activities of the United States on the territory of Ukraine. And at quarter past three this afternoon, President Biden will speak from the White House, announcing details of America's continued response to the Russian invasion. Plenty uh, to be keeping an eye on there. Well, the UK has announced sanctions on 386 Russian politicians who supported Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. The sanctions mean bans on travel to the UK and also the freezing of assets for those who voted for the independence of separatist regions Luhansk and also Donetsk. Well, we can go live now to Westminster and bring in our political correspondent, uh, Joe Pike. Uh, turning up the heat, it would appear, Joe, but this is really something that the EU did two, two weeks ago. Yeah, there has been pretty consistent criticism of the pace of the UK sanctions effort, in particular uh, sanctions on uh, individuals uh, in this country or who could travel to this country or, of course, have assets in this country. Those are the sanctions that will affect these 386 members of the Duma, the lower house of the Russian parliament, who voted 
to uh, recognise the independence of those two breakaway uh, republics. And now uh, Liz Truss and her team, who have been criticised by Labour for not um, sanctioning enough individuals, now say that their total list is 800 long. That is 800 companies, individuals and entities. She's also said from Washington DC, where she's meeting members of the Biden administration, we will not let up the pressure and we will continue to tighten the screw. We're historically and, and uh, by nature a, a, a very, very generous and uh, open, welcoming people. But people only, want to we've welcome. We've only issued a thousand. People want to. Uh, well, that was the number yesterday, pieces, and yeah. I'm, it's rising the whole time, and it will rise very sharply. If you personally intervened, it to will try and rise fix it. very sharply. So if you had to on, personally intervene on uh, on Monday. Uh, you'll get from the. Uh, from uh, from the Leveling Up Secretary, uh, you'll get uh, the programme that will allow people to come in. So people people but want to welcome you... it into their own homes. They can do so. Another criticism of the government, of course, being touched upon there by the Prime Minister speaking to our political editor, Beth Rigby, is how the UK has responded on Ukrainian refugees. The PM making it clear that on Monday there will be an announcement of a new scheme that will facilitate UK nationals to take in an individual or a family. There'll be a website to accompany it, but it is incredibly complex. Going to understand there were uh, meetings last night with four different government departments to lay out the details. The details are so important because we're potentially talking about incredibly vulnerable women and children who may have had a traumatic journey to this country but also may have seen some pretty horrendous things in their own country. The government also need to work out whether these people are entitled to work, whether they're entitled to benefits and how long the UK uh, national uh, receiving them needs to commit to. Is it one month? Is it three months? Is it six months? But Sam, Michael Gove will set out the details on Monday. All right, certainly one to uh, be keeping an eye on there, Joe. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just want to bring you an update coming to us from the UN, who has confirmed 564 civilian deaths in Ukraine. While Russian forces continue to advance on Kiev while being met with strong pushback from Ukrainian troops. Joining me now is the Ukrainian MP Inna Sovson, who is in uh, the Kiev region. A very warm welcome to you on Sky News. Describe for us, if you would, what uh, you can see taking place within the capital city. Well, the situation here is tense. We don't know whether the Russians would actually be able to get into the city. It seems that the Ukrainian army is fighting back. They did manage to attack them on northeast direction, and actually the Russian troops did have to surrender a bit uh, uh, closer to the Belarusian border, uh, which does give hope to all of us. Uh, but still, we know that they are not giving up and they can try to gather forces and to enter the city of Kiev, regardless of uh, two weeks of uh, fruitless attempts to do so. So the situation in Kiev, despite much, much better than in cities like Kharkiv or particularly Mariupol, uh, it's still tense because we are uh, we have seen what they're doing to the cities where they get into. And that is indeed extremely scary. So we do have to trust our army right now that they will actually manage to keep them on the entrances to the city. And also the city itself has been very strongly fortified. Uh, so there are checkpoints. Uh, it's extremely difficult to get into the city. So that has given us hope. But of course, we do see that the level of cruelty by the Russians is, is growing up. So, well, we have to, to get ready for anything to happen. Um, the mayor of Kiev says that uh, he believes that they have enough supplies to hold out for two weeks. Yes, that uh, seems to be uh, what has been happening in the past two weeks. Uh, the city has been getting prepared for potential blockade or a siege. Of course, the, the supply chains have been broken. Uh, and uh, the main route from the West uh, is now blockaded by the Russians because they do take did take control of that uh, road from the West. But it seems like, uh, well, there is enough to survive. Uh, but of course, that all depends on, on whether we shall be able to prevail and, and the Ukrainian army will manage to kick them further from the, from the capital. Uh, we again did see some success both in Kiev, we did see some success in Kharkiv, where they've been pushed uh, further from the city. But of course, uh, those uh, terrible attacks from air is probably what is most terrifying, because what you are seeing now on the picture, now on the video, those are the results of attack from air. And there is not much Ukrainian army can do um, unless we do get some support in terms of uh, protecting our skies. So, um, 
Mr Klitschko also says that there are two, two million people, he believes, still in your capital city. And his brother says that actually people who initially fled are coming back to try and help fortify the city. Uh, well, the situation is diverse. Indeed, some people did uh, flee the city in different period of times. Then uh, many people who got evacuated from the neighboring cities of Irpin and Bucha, they are all actually getting located in the city as of right now, because uh, traveling, uh, traveling to the west is, is again complicated. Uh, and again, in the Kiev city itself, it does seem to be much, much uh, safer because the air defense is functioning much better than in many other areas. So people are coming back. Uh, we do see this trend, not just for the city of Kiev, but for Ukraine overall. We do know that since the first day of war, over 140,000 men returned from abroad uh, to fight in the army or in the territorial defense. So this is a general trend, which we hope will help us uh, save them, at least the capital city. And the humanitarian corridors don't seem to be working. I, have you any hope that they can work to get the people out who want to leave? Well, they do work with different um, success, I would say, because clearly the humanitarian corridor from the city of Mariupol are not working. Every time the Russians are promising any type of humanitarian corridor, they are either citing the land landmines there or they open fire. So as of right now, people are not even trying to get into evacuation corridor from Mariupol, despite the situation over there being tragic. Uh, the Russians are bombarding the city from air every 30 minutes. And they're bombarding uh, not just the, the hospital, as we have seen, they are bombarding the residential area. So I think that the city of Mariupol is now the biggest victim in this Russian aggression, and they're trying to arrange for a full-scale blockade over there. As for other cities, uh, the evacuation did take place from the neighboring cities of Irpin, Vucha, and Hostomel near Kiev. Not from the first attempt. We did have uh, many uh, previous attempts where the Russian uh, opened fire on people trying to evacuate. People are evacuating in, in extreme conditions. Uh, I did see pictures of people evacuating by walking on, on the small uh, river uh, in, in, in freezing weather. Uh, that's how they have to get out of, of the city of Irpin because the, um, uh, because the, uh, the bridge was, uh, was destroyed over there. Uh, but, but it seems like we did manage to evacuate uh, uh, some number of people. Uh, according to the recent data from the Ukrainian government, about 50,000 people have been evacuated, but that's not nearly, nearly enough uh, of what we need. And uh, particularly in some distant cities like in Sumer, it's extremely difficult to get evacuated and the Russians are always uh, trying to attack those corridors. So people are doing that, you know, uh, it, it's a gamble for them on their life. And Inna, I want to ask you, um, there are claims, fears that uh, Russia may be imminently about to use chemical weapons on the people of Ukraine. What do people in uh, Kiev think about that and how, how long, how hopeful are you that you can hold the capital city? Well, the chemical weapon uh, is, uh, is a big threat. We are all extremely concerned. Uh, the Ministry of Health has been disseminated information about what you need to do in, in case of the chemical attack. Uh, we have another threat because uh, just about an hour ago, Ukrainian intelligence uh, uh, said that they have information that the Russians might try to arrange for some terrorist attack in the Chernobyl nuclear power station, with they, which they are holding from the first day of the attack. And that would be a threat not just to the Ukrainians, that would be a threat to the whole of Europe. And that is why, yeah, of course, we are extremely terrified. We are terrified for our lives, for the lives of our loved ones. And, and that is why we, uh, we really hope that the West will intervene and uh, help us in that, uh, in terms of securing the no-fly zone so that we can, uh, you know, continue fighting on the ground and possibly pushing them further into, into their borders so that they will not uh, attack with chemical weapon and will not think about arranging some sort of terrorist attack on the nuclear power station. But the risk is real. It's here. We, we are going to bed every day thinking about this. And, and this is, frankly speaking, just terrifying. And in terms of what you want to see coming from Western nations, in our, I mean, it looks like that you know the the uh, the no-fly zone isn't going to happen. What realistically do you think that you can get that you really need? Oh, we do need a no-fly zone. It doesn't change because they are killing us from air. 
they do have a superiority in the air and uh, they have the superiority because they have uh, much more airplanes, but also because they are bombarding our civilian population. There is really very little we can do in terms of uh, helping our people all over Ukraine. And they are bombarding just random cities. Just this morning, we woke up to the news that they bombarded uh, two cities in Western Ukraine, where many, many people from the East have uh, relocated. And then one city in, in uh, center East Ukraine and the city of Dnipro, which is a very big city in the central Ukraine. So uh, that is still what we need. Uh, we cannot really win in this war without support from the air. And that's why we're asking for it so much, because if we have support from the air in any in, in any way possible, be it by giving us the, the fighter jets or giving us the air defense system that we can operate ourselves, that would be a crucial help that would actually give us a winning chance in this terrible, terrible war that we are, uh, we are that Putin launched against us. So, so that is still the, the primary issue in terms of securing um, the lives of Ukrainians. But because the second big thing that uh, we keep on asking is, is further uh, sanctions, because uh, the sanctions, uh, um, and I've just heard what uh, you were reporting about, the personal sanctions, we really hope that they would have been uh, imposed way, way earlier. We are happy that now uh, the United Kingdom is thinking about imposing the sanctions against people who uh, voted uh, to support the uh, recognition of, of those uh, People's Republic on the east of Ukraine. But we are also asking to impose personal sanctions against their family members because their children cannot be studying in the United Kingdom right now. That is not uh, how it should be. Their children should be, uh, you know, their visa should be canceled as well. They should go back to Mother Russia. All the assets of their children, of their family members should be frozen because we do know that uh, they are not really, you know, signing up their own um, their bank accounts. They have money on the bank accounts on their, of their family members. So we are asking for, for individual sanctions because we believe that people who are responsible for what is happening to us, for killing Ukrainians, for killing our children, they need to have some personal effect in their own life. Uh, be it uh, inability to travel, uh, frozen assets, uh, uh, their children not being able to continue their education in the United Kingdom, they should have some personal consequences. Because right now, those consequences that uh, there are for Russia overall, the, the people who are directly responsible are not feeling them for themselves. OK, uh, really good of you to share your thoughts with us um, on Sky News. Inna Sobson, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, amid the refugee crisis, a new visa processing centre will be set up in the French city of Arras for Ukrainians who are trying to come to Britain. Well, Laura Bundock uh, joins me now uh, from that, uh, that centre. Uh, hello there, Laura. You found it at last. Yeah, it was a bit of a uh, wild goose chase because, don't forget, on Monday it was meant to be Calais. Then Wednesday, it was meant to be Lille, which is about an hour away. And today, Friday, it's Arras. Now, this is a, a government kind of local administrative building here. And this is where, via appointments only, no walk-ins, some Ukrainians will have help and be guided through the visa application process. As I say, it'll only be for people who are referred here and only people deemed eligible, i.e. at the moment, people with family in the UK. But it has been... A palaver, let's be honest, getting to this point. Um, and the, the reality is it's caused a lot more uh, disturbance, upset for the Ukrainian families who thought they could get to the Britain relatively easy. They heard about the scheme with visas. They knew they had the family. They had the correct documentation in most cases, but the forms took forever. All the forms are in English, so painful situations where it took about an hour per person to fill out a form to apply for the visa. Uh, then they had to go sort out biometric testing. The nearest centres, Paris and Brussels, which is why this pop-up one was set up. That's all going to be made easier from next week when the virtual system comes into play. But it has been hard work. And you talk about centres moving from city to city, but the reality for people is that the, the, the people I met yesterday who'd been bussed from Calais to the outskirts of Lille to pretty grotty accommodation, many of whom have young children, they just want to get somewhere safe now. They've said goodbye to husbands, to their lives, their jobs, their kids, schools in Ukraine. Their husbands are fighting. 
they want to get somewhere safe for the short term. I didn't meet anyone who said they had a long-term ambition to live in the UK. I spoke to one woman who was telling me doesn't need money, doesn't need benefits, just wants that family home she knows is waiting for her. They thought they'd be in the UK by now, but no, they're still here in France filling out the forms, waiting for reapproval before they can then make the final bit of this huge journey across to the UK. It goes on. Laura, thank you. You're watching Sky News coming up. President Putin tells his Belarusian counterpart there are positive signs in talks with Ukraine. Welcome back. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has told his Belarusian counterpart that there are positive signs in the talks taking place with Ukraine. He was holding a Security Council meeting this morning. He spoke to Alexander Lukashenko a little earlier. Attempts to stem our development have always been taken. And there are attempts to do this now on a much larger scale, of course, and, and that's obvious. But I'm confident that we will overcome these difficulties and will gain more competences, more ability to feel independent and self-sufficient. Ultimately, this will only be useful, just like in the previous years. I will, of course, update you about the situation on Ukraine and, first of all, on, on the course of negotiations that, were, that are being conducted on a daily basis. There are some positive shifts, as um, I was told by our negotiators on our side. I will let you know all the details in a moment.
And our Moscow correspondent Diana Magne joins me now. Diana, suggestions today that Moscow may bring in fighters from the Middle East. That's right. Uh, President Putin held a meeting of his Security Council earlier this morning and discussed bringing in what he called um, volunteers from the Middle East to uh, assist in the liberation, which is the way Russia puts it, of the people of Donbass. And his defence minister, Sergei Shoigu, said that there were already 16,000 of these volunteers um, in Syria and the Middle East who had uh, suggested that they would want to come and engage in the fight or special military operation, as, as Russia likes to call it. Um, and we have seen some videos supposedly aired uh, from Russia's Ministry of Defense of people who are keen to join. Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, was asked in his daily call uh, what exactly that meant, that uh, Russia had to be sure that there weren't any radicals amongst them. Um, and he said there is a very big difference between those who fought radicals and those who are radicals, and it would clearly be those who fought them. Uh, Alexander Lukashenko and Vladimir Putin are meeting now um, in the Kremlin. Uh, interesting developments uh, to tell you, though, also about uh, Meta, which is, of course, the new name for Facebook. Um, uh, overnight, there were reports that um, Meta had eased its policy in relation to um, certain comments about uh, the Russian armed forces, that it was um, not blocked to make pretty inflammatory comments about the Russian armed forces. And that has caused, precipitated a very rapid response from Russia with the prosecutor general demanding that the media regulator block all Meta's platforms in Russia, which is Facebook, Instagram and uh, WhatsApp. Um, the prosecutor general making that uh, statement actually on Instagram, which is pretty ironic, but it shows you how deep rooted those networks are in this country and is another indication of really how much of a sort of squeeze there is on the information space. You know, here in Moscow, so much is done on Instagram. You book everything on Instagram. That will all go at a time when you can really feel the sanctions crunch uh, coming in. So you heard from Vladimir Putin earlier that he feels Russia can weather the storm. I think it may take quite a while before uh, before we see, you know, the storm ending. Diana, thank you. Now, attempts are being made to help the people who are trapped in the besieged city of Mariupol. Earlier, the city's deputy mayor told me that thousands of people trapped in the city, they're no longer scared of the bombing because they're just too desperate for food and water. The situation is awful. Uh, Russian army continues to do airstrikes, air bombing, artillery shelling, and uh, their mm, troops are behind the city. And in some districts of the city, we have war, um, street battles. So as you understand, the humanitarian situation decrease hour by hour, second by second. And the Ukrainian army tries to defeat our city at the very moment. Of course, I should stand optimistic. And from our side, from uh, City Council and from uh, the Ukrainian part, we do our best to provide humanitarian corridors. So anyway, we are ready to transfer trucks with humanitarian goods from Zaporizhia to Mariupol. But it's the seventh day of our attempt and uh, we do not find any solution because trucks go uh, some, um, some length and they stop uh, over a Russian checkpoint and do not, they do not allow to go uh, to Mariupol. And uh, as you know, we are under continuous bombing and shelling directly in the city and there is no any ceasefire any ceasefire this night we had eight uh, cases of air strikes so they are destroying all the city hour by hour and killing our civil people reports in the u.s certainly believes it's um, its intelligence believes that president putin may be about to use chemical weapons on the people in Ukraine. What are the what are the feelings? What are the fears of people in Mariupol about that? You know, uh, without any utility, without connection, without everything for eight days, they do not know about this news anything. And you should know that um, five to seven days before, uh, the best wish uh, of our people was to uh, stop somehow the war, to stop bombing, to stop shelling. But today, uh, 
uh, and yesterday their best wish is to find some food and water. They even do not afraid and scared about continuous bombing and shell, and they just want to find some water and some food. And Putin and his army does not allow to provide any ceasefire and any humanitarian, medical, social, or any other help for injured and uh, suffered people, suffering people. Uh, during night, there was uh, eight different airplanes that uh, bombed the city and flattened the city. They absolutely destroy our biggest steel plant as of style. It does not exist anymore. And they are destroying all the buildings, all the district. It's You should understand it's an unmanaged bomb with one ton of tortilla equivalent. So the diameter of uh, after this bomb is 30 meters, 40 meters. So they are destroying building by building. That's the Deputy Mayor of Mariupol speaking to me earlier on the programme. You're watching Sky News coming up. Concerns mount that Putin may resort to using chemical weapons in Ukraine. We'll be discussing that after the break. push the protesters further back here. There's around two or three hundred still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News's West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the moment are a lifesaver. It's all, it's all we've got. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region, hearing from people who have real stories. I'm going to have nowhere to live for about three or four months. There are still people inside the properties here. They are coming from the epicentre of what is now a global health pandemic. seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. It was desperately sad and the fact it was happening right in the heart of this community. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future then? Bleak. Might all be finished, I don't know. Now, Britain and America have accused Russia of lying in order to justify carrying out a possible chemical attack in Ukraine. Moscow, meanwhile, has called for an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council, claiming, without any evidence, that the US has been developing biological weapons in Ukraine. Well, Andy Webber was President Obama's Assistant Secretary of Defence, responsible for nuclear, chemical and biological defence programmes, and he now sits on the Council of Strategic Risks. Uh, Andy, good to see you this afternoon. Can we just start with the Russian allegations about US-sponsored biological warfare labs in Ukraine? Well, these claims are not new, actually, since about 15 years ago through sort of KGB style disinformation campaigns, um, media placements with Bulgarian journalists, et cetera. Russia has been promoting these claims, but 
They've escalated in the last uh, months and weeks and even days to an official level where the highest uh, leaders, even Putin and President Xi, in their joint statement are making these outrageous false claims. Um, and apparently they've called uh, a meeting of the UN Security Council to, to air this propaganda today. Um, but a U.S. administration official has said that, has acknowledged the existence of U.S.-funded biological research facilities in the country. Yes, yeah, so I was personally very involved in, in leading the creation of this uh, partnership between Ukraine and the United States uh, starting in 2005. We uh, worked with Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture uh, public health and animal health laboratories to improve Ukraine's ability to uh, detect, diagnose, and respond to infectious disease outbreaks. So think of it as uh, small uh, centers for disease control type laboratories that are totally transparent, do peaceful work, uh, peaceful research to, for example, to counter the COVID pandemic. It, it's an extremely useful uh, effort. And do you have collaborations like that with many countries around the world? Yes, as a matter of fact, over 30 countries are working with the U.S. Department of Defense to create what we call an early warning network uh, for infectious disease outbreaks so we can nip them in the bud at the source before they spread around the world and become a pandemic. Do you agree with the assessment, Andy, that uh, U.S. intelligence is suggesting and that the U.K. Prime Minister is also uh, fearful of potentially an imminent chemical weapons attack on the people of Ukraine from Russia? Yes, I, I think it is a, a grave concern that Russia, like its ally uh, Syria, could use either chemical or biological weapons against civilians uh, in Ukraine and then just as uh, President Assad in Syria did, uh, blame it on Ukraine. So it, we call this a false flag attack. And I think that's one explanation of why they're ramping up their uh, insidious propaganda campaign. Um, I know that you, uh, you were part of the Obama administration. At the time, uh, chemical weapons, the use of in Syria was declared as the red line beyond which nobody could go. And I know that you were responsible for uh, dealing with the decommissioning of chemical weapons in Syria. But was it a mistake to have not just instigated airstrikes at the time? Because people are saying that that lack of military response has resulted in leaders like Putin thinking that they can use chemical weapons with impunity. Well, I strongly disagree with that. I was part of an effort, a multinational effort, with the UK, the United Nations, to safely remove and destroy 1,300 tons of chemical weapons agents from Syria, um, including horrible agents like VX and sarin. So that's 1,300 tons that the regime can't use against its neighbors and against its own uh, men, women, and children like they did in August of 2013 on the sub in the Ghouta uh, outside of Damascus. So that was a very successful operation um, without um, firing a shot. It would have been very hard to do that, uh, in, impossible actually to do that in some type of a, a military attack. But do you not, but, but by declaring it a red line and then not instigating the airstrikes, which there was, there were a number of countries calling for it, uh, has that not weakened our credibility, do you think, in the eyes of Vladimir Putin? Well, who knows? In the head of Vladimir Putin, anything is possible, especially in his current uh, desperate state as, as the war that he uh, started is not going very well. But actually, the red line worked. We, we successfully, using the threat of military force, were able to denude uh, Syria of its enormous uh, and very dangerous chemical weapons stockpile. Yeah, but here we are talking about potentially an imminent chemical weapon attack um, instigated by Russia on Ukraine. Well, Russia is a country that used uh, very advanced chemical weapons in peacetime uh, in, in Salisbury, England. So, and, and more recently against Navalny inside Russia. So I think this is a very realistic concern that they might use chemical weapons in the current uh, uh, war against Ukraine and uh, blame it on the United States or uh, Ukrainians 
but it's uh, it's absurd, it's desperate, and we need to be very uh, frank and open and public that their charges of, of illicit uh, biological weapons labs in Ukraine are just poppycock. And Andy, do you know uh, about what Russia has been stockpiling in terms of its chemical weapons? If there is an attack, do we know what it would look like? What would they use? Well, the Soviet Union had the world's largest chemical weapons and biological weapons program in total violation of the chemical and biological weapons conventions. These weapons are prohibited. Um, so they could use uh, advanced chemical weapons like Novichok, um, VX, Sarin, uh, in attacks to, uh, to terrorize the public, to clear buildings. Uh, they could also use more uh, uh, available things like chlorine gas. Um, as in terms of biological weapons, I think they're less likely to use something that's contagious, that spreads human to human, because that could spread back into Russia. So they're more likely to use something that doesn't spread human to human, like anthrax, which has tremendous okay. ability. Okay, Andy Weber, I'm really sorry to cut you off, but we are out of time. Thank you for your time on Sky News. Thank you, Samantha.